tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs and become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 2. I'm your host, Jason Hill. And are you hungry? Because I'm starving. What are you thinking, pizza? No? Eh. Okay. Mm. Tacos. No again. Um. Hmm. Chinese. No? What are you doing to me? Don't be like that. Come on. Uh, fine. What would you like tonight? Ah. Carlson's, eh? Fish and chips? Now we're talking. I think that'll do quite nicely. Shall we? By the way... If Horror Hill really is your thing, and if you're hearing it, I'm guessing it is, why not become a patron? Just five bucks a month, folks, and that goes a long way on this end, let me tell you. The more money comes in, the less I get beat up at my day job, and the more y'all get to beat me up in the comments section. Yes, I know. My accents aren't always spot on, but thank you so much for pointing that out. Again. I'm joking, it all comes from a place of love. And just remember, if I didn't try it, I'd never get better at it. But here we are getting off track again. Five bucks! Not much. No ads. All the shows. Just for you. Horror Hill is blowing up, baby. Why don't you get in on the ground floor? Think on it some. Mwah. Now. Allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And now, without further ado... From author Nick Carlson, I give you The Red Fish. The Brazilian name for the red fish, known among scientific circles as the Arupaima. If you've never heard of the red fish before now, then prepare yourself, because you won't be forgetting it anytime soon. Imagine 
a living torpedo, pushing 10 feet and 500 pounds of bone, muscle, and iron-hard scales. Imagine a primordial, upturned, snake-like head helming a sleek, tapering body behind it, sporting drab olive green on its flanks that melds into vibrant floral red as it approaches its scallop-shaped tail. Now, give this creature a psychological addiction to power and speed, and an unyielding temper to match. To put it another way, people have died from this fish, being struck by their solid bony heads as they jump. With cracked skulls or ruptured lungs, they fall out of their boats and sink, unable to draw breath. Darkness and turbulent mud, the last thing they see before the light snuffs out. Those who survive an attack walk away with broken bones, scarred hearts, and a healthy newfound fear literally hammered into them. In terms of diet, however, they only eat small animals. Humans are off the menu. Their aggressive responses are triggered when they feel cornered, or during the breeding season when protecting their young. But in my opinion, when it doesn't make it much better. Consider this. Which animal would impart the worst death? The one that kills for food because it has to? Or the one whose only concern is ensuring its own survival by any means necessary? That's what we were after. That's what motivated our endeavor of greed and destruction. That's what led to where we are today, here and there, all over the place, spread out so thin, we'll never be put back together. This episode of Horror Hill is proudly brought to you by BetterHell. You smell that? In the air? All those burning leaves? How about how all those sections of the supermarket just vanish and are magically replaced with oversized bags of Reese's peanut butter cups and, perplexingly, Tootsie Rolls? Ugh. I suppose there's no accounting for taste. Regardless, these are signs. Signs that that sexy, beautiful mother of all months, October, has come to join us. But if you're anything like me, your pre-October excitement is immediately replaced by post-October depression, regardless of the fact that we have three whole weeks of October left. Yeah, it's a bummer. That sweet-smelling spot of fall foliage wedged between two of the lamest months of the year, September and November. And yeah, it ends. And if you're anything like me, you'll need to talk to somebody about it. Somebody who can help you put things in perspective. Remind you that even though October ends, there will always be another one. And a licensed professional counselor specializing in pre-post-October depression can only be found in one place. And that place is BetterHelp. The online counseling service that's only as far away as your phone or computer. I personally like BetterHelp because I don't have to leave my house. Because if I step outside my door in October, I will immediately break into hysterical crying because all those beautiful orange and yellow and red colors will be nothing but sticks very soon. But I try not to think about it. I leave that to better help. All it takes is a quick visit to their website, a brief assessment of your needs, and you'll be talking to your counselor in under 48 hours. It's that fast. So don't let October pass you by. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash horrorhill. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash horrorhill.
Inquisitors is the term I'd use to describe ourselves. Our organization existed solely to provide covert resources in the acquisition of whatever it was we were paid to nab. Laws, politics, socioeconomic status. It mattered not to us, as long as the client followed through with the price we quoted. After that, it was no questions asked. We did what we needed to follow through in our word. No double standards. No acknowledged pleasantries. Point A to point B. Depending on the jobs we carried out, and those who fell victim to our work, we were given a host of other labels, each nastier than the rest. Mercenaries. Traffickers. Thieves. Assassins. And in the case of the red fish, poachers. I perfectly remember the conversation I had earlier that day. The palace seemed to breathe gold with its gilded pillars and cavernous hallways that swam in dim candlelight. Private security guards led me down the corridors to my client's den, an opulent office space adorned with expensive frescoes and cages of exotic birds. Behind the client's desk was a window the size of a small house, overlooking the Essequibo River, gleaming silver and yellow in the rising sun. The whole place stank of exploitation and arrogance. I gazed at the rosewood walls rising two stories above, almost hearing the cries of the animals and trees that had once called this plot of land home. But I hadn't come here to judge. My client regarded me with a stony expression as I sat down. Maybe he thought the live jaguar dozing on his desk between us would be intimidating, to give him some kind of edge over me. But I met his face with a similar blankness. It would take more than a jungle cat to impress me. Thank you for agreeing to meet here, he said. He gestured around his den. You like it? It's, um, very grandiose, I settled with. Very, he agreed. Spared no expense. I have the will and I have the means. Who am I to deny what I want? He scratched the jaguar's ears, who replied with a syrupy growl. Unfortunately, despite my best efforts, there are still things in this world that elude me. Have you heard of the Piraruku? Gringo. Red fish, I answered. Yeah, I know of it. Mana of the gods, he said wistfully. One fish can feed a village for a week. And for the more inclined towards the culinary arts, they make for the most wonderful seared steaks. I tell you, man, I have sampled beasts from all over the world, and none compared to the Piraruku. His tone hardened. But the local government does not respect my tastes. As we speak, our representatives, and I do use that term loosely, are ratifying laws banning the harvesting of the red fish. Try as I might, I cannot sway a coalition of progressive bureaucrats. And all this is on the heels of a biannual feast I throw for my friends in this beautiful palace. Every six months, I serve prime piraruku cuts to my guests. It's the only thing I can exclusively offer to them. But if I cannot get what I want this time, then I have no leverage. No standing. He stood up, pacing around his desk. I refuse to be anything less than I have proven to be. I need to uphold my image. I need the red fish. You want me to illegally capture and bring back a wild, uh, Piraruku, I guessed. Hit the nail on the head, he confirmed, punching to stroke the jaguar's flank. I nodded. I never thought I'd have to play a glorified fisherman in my line of work, but work was work, and I dwelled on it no further sounds straightforward enough. K. 
can you possibly tell me where I can find them? Actually, I can, my client said, straightening up. Up river, about twenty miles is a reserve, for lack of a better term. A tract of wetlands some liberal environmentalist types have set up for the Piruku. Probably American, he added with distaste. The red fish is rare enough in these parts already. Way I see it, you can scour the jungle for days, rooting through lakes and swamps in the off chance you find a suitable specimen. Or you could sneak into the reserve, slip past the Americans, and just pick one up. Like it was a um, bag of groceries. I briefly considered the options. Expediency is my M.O., I said. Me and my men will infiltrate that reserve and find you the biggest, fattest piruku they have. No one will stand in our way. My client smiled and held out his hand. You, sir, you're one of the good ones. The journey upriver could not have gone any smoother. I gathered together a crew of contacts stationed in the country, all dressed in civilian attire. We were to pose as a group of old friends, reuniting in Guiana for a bit of sport fishing along the river. Quote, unquote, just like we used to. We'd take the ferry up to the tributary, claiming we wanted to fish the point where it merged with the main channel then slowly make our way up until we hit the entrance to the reserve. The gear bags and tackle boxes we brought along with us, in fact, held spear guns, crossbows, and pistols. We hoped the first two weapons would be all we needed to quickly and stealthily obtain a piruku. The pistols would only be if things got out of hand. The trip ate up most of the morning. The only noteworthy thing was the chatterbox of a ferryman, who took to probing our crew about what we were doing. I handled all the talking. What are you all fishing for? He inquired. Payara and Trahira, realistically, I answered. And if we're lucky, uh, Surabim? Ah, of course, he exclaimed. So, you're not going after the Piruku? I feigned confusion. Excuse me? Ah, I don't know any other name. It's the, uh, the big fish with the red tail that jumps. Oh, you mean the Arapaima, I said. No, no, we're not equipped for those guys. Good, good, said the ferryman, turning doer. They're on the brink, my friend. Thankfully, they're about to pass laws to protect them. And it was only because of the tribesmen that our gutless politicians finally went through with it. They're tribesmen? I asked, legitimately interested this time. Yes, yes, uh, some indigenous tribes sent ambassadors to come out and try to convince our representatives to help them to protect the Piraruku, he explained. The fish is important for their spiritual practices, see? And they're being wiped out faster than they can keep up with. Yes, we're just too damn good at what we do. He shook his head disdainfully, plundering the river of its resources. I mulled over this new information as he gabbed away. I wondered if the American activists had somehow garnered an agreement with these native tribes to build the reserve together. Only now do I realize how foolish that sentiment was. We disembarked at our stop, six of us, three per dugout canoe and paddled up the fateful tributary. The tropical sun was sweltering as we forced ourselves up the channel. It was nearing the end of the dry season. The water was muddy and winding, barely deep enough for our boats in some spots. This was preferable, though. Low waters meant the fish would be contained in isolated pockets, and considering their air-breathing habits, they'd be easy to spot whenever they broke the surface. 
Jagged protruding rocks and fallen trees only slightly impeded our progress. We found ourselves occasionally having to drag our canoes over dry land to pass up a barrier, but with six men and rates I promised them as payment, nothing was too much for us. The final barrier a few miles up piqued my interest. Sharpened wooden pikes jutted from the water facing downstream, like the spiked walls of a moat. Someone had definitely placed them there to keep trespassers out. I stood up in my perch, peering over the pikes. Beyond, the water tapered out into a vast wetland lined with tall grass. We're here, I said. That's when something pricked me in the neck. I scarcely had time to pluck the thing from my skin when toxic drowsiness overtook my senses. My fingers went limp, and the dart slipped from my grasp into the water. I collapsed, my vision blackening, watching the rest of my crew shudder and fall with me before everything went cold and dark. The sight before us made me wish I had never woken up. I first realized the six of us had been stripped and bound, hands knotted with vines behind our backs, forced into a kneeling position on the forest floor. I felt a scalding heat on my face. The very air seemed to shimmer before me, on account of the blazing campfire in front of us, its green wood emitting acrid black smoke. It was still the daytime, early afternoon, so I could easily see our captors surrounding us. One look told me they were indigenous, short, toned, clad only in leaves and loincloths, their deep red skin painted over with vivid black and white skeletal patterns. They sneered and hissed, scepters and spears bristling in their grips. My heart sank. I hadn't prepared for the possibility of such a swift ambush. My client had claimed we'd only be dealing with American activists, not exactly the fighting type. What the ferryman told me suddenly fell into place. The reserve belonged to them. And the Americans, if there even were any, might have met their fates at their hands. What do you want with us? I croaked my throat stinging from the fumes. A bizarre exchange erupted to my left. Someone rasped in what I could only assume to be the tribe's language. A second voice responded in the same tongue. You came here to hunt the red fish? The first voice wheezed. I forced myself to look. It took all my willpower not to shout. Strung up between two tribesmen was an emaciated nude white man his long hair matted and tangled. His lips were cracked, and his eyes... His eyes were empty, putrescent sockets. To my sustained horror, I saw hollow vines had been stuck under the skin of his sore-ridden arms, vines that ran up to fluid-filled sacks made of leaves, toted by the tribesmen flanking him. A primitive ivy system... They were keeping him just barely alive. To translate. No! (coughs) I yelled, my voice strangled. We wanted (coughs) to fish for Surabim. The same double exchange. We searched your bags, the translator snapped. You do not need spear guns or firearms to hunt Surabim. We use handguns when fishing in Alaska, I countered thinking on my feet. We put down halibut once we bring them in our boats. The Surabim are no different. The exchange. You've proven yourself fit for nothing but lies, the translator said. That will be one bullet for each lie. One of the tribesmen stepped forward and stuck out his arm. I barely registered one of our guns in his hand before he pressed it to one of the men's foreheads and pulled the trigger. The spray of blood hadn't even settled before he executed the next man. 
We panicked and struggled against our bonds, showered by a fine mist of salty blood. But the tribesmen emptied the magazine into the air, the concussive ringing bangs finally forcing us into silence. I start talking the truth, or they'll water the ground with the rest of your brains, the translator leered. All right, all right, I gasped, fighting the rising wine in my ear. Yes, yes, we came to find a red fish, but nothing more than that. All we need is one. If you have a sickly one, or, or even a dead one, that is all that we want. We won't venture here again. We won't tell anyone about you. The exchange. Pillagers and parasites. That's all you are. The translator growled. This forest has suffered enough without you worms slowly killing it with just one more piece. We have no loyalty to our clients, I said. We are only doing the job we were hired to do. Mere agents of circumstance, we have no stake in either side. We don't deserve your righteous anger. Please. All I ask is to work with me here. The exchange. If all you seek is a single red fish, then capture one if you can, said the translator. But you will face the gauntlet. You will crawl through the muck like a small, pathetic creature. He interpreted more vocal growls from the tribesmen. Make it to the end of the reserve, and you're free to go. But if you have no red fish, you must leave without one and never come back. All the while, we will hunt you. Even as our captors reached down to undo our bonds, scrambled thoughts raged in my mind. I had been in more dangerous situations in the past, but never one where I had been so helpless, so stripped of my faculties. I couldn't imagine my contacts had ever found themselves in such dire straits either. Finishing the job was one thing, but staying alive to actually follow through was something I rarely had to consider. Until today... We give you no fanfare, the translator said. Start running! The tribesman knocked an arrow. We bolted, vaulting over the headless corpses of a third of our party. Cruel, mocking laughter followed us as we barreled through the clearing and into the dense cover of trees. The arrow lodged in a trunk barely a foot from my head. The further in we ran, the wetter and flatter the ground became until we were up to our shins in muddy, putrid swamp water. We stopped, straining to listen out for approaching hunters in the distance. Apart from our sharp, labored panting, we seemed to be alone. The other three men took their time to catch their breath. Then, they all turned and glared at me. What the fuck was that about? One of them snapped. A man whom I only knew by his code name, Gamma. Because of you, two of us are dead back there, Delta concurred. Did you know we'd be facing armed hostiles? Epsilon demanded. I was never told about any of this, I protested. Apparently, our client was misinformed. Or lied, Gamma muttered. None of that matters now, Epsilon interjected. What matters is what we do from here. If we get out of the reserve, they will stop hunting us. The pikes are about a mile south. We can make it if we run. Belay that, I said, stepping up to him. They're giving us a chance. And if we don't deliver what we promised to our client, we don't get paid. And we get blacklisted upon our return. We'll die trying to catch one of those fish, said Delta. You would rather die than get out of this mess alive? I have never failed a client yet, I said. And I am not going to let some fucked up indigenous types get in my way. We are outgunned and outnumbered, Gamma snarled. They won't hesitate to kill us. 
If they wanted us dead, it would have been so by now, I reasoned. I looked past them, back the way we came. They are toying with us. They don't believe we can make it, much less apprehend one of their precious red fish. Frankly, I'd like to spit in their faces, on both accounts. Your pride will lead us to our deaths, said Delta. The risk of death was always part of this job, I retorted. What the hell did you think you signed on for? I don't fear death, said Gamma. What I fear is being sentenced to death under false pretenses by ignorant, dishonest clients. Once that trust is breached, consider my services null and void. Epsilon and Delta grunted in agreement. I gaped at them. Gentlemen, we are supposed to be the best of the best. Cutthroat. Elite. What they turn to when no one else will fit the bill. You renege on this now, and it's over for you. For all of us. The three of them glared at me. For a moment, I thought they'd consider it. A tribal shout echoed from the woods, and I snapped over to look at it, then back at me. Oh, not like this, said Epsilon. Naked, misled, undignified. He averted his gaze and trudged away. Delta and Gamma followed him. I kept quiet, opting to stick to the back of the group. Unbeknownst to them, I was seething, mouthing silent curses at their backs. I, myself, would bring back a Piraruku to spite them. To spite them all. Long overlooked in the hallowed halls of antiquity, before even the fall of mighty Babylon, mankind has had a complex relationship with fees. According to a recent translation of the famous Dead Fee Scrolls, a tale of two brothers is told. One brother, in desperate need of a new shepherd's crook, asked the other brother if he could borrow 26 shekels to cover the cost. The other brother, and indeed a loyal brother was he, agreed and lent his brother 26 shekels. However, since the other brother had already loaned the one brother five shekels the previous week, he immediately charged the brother San Shepherd's Crook 33 shekels as an overdraft fee. In the end, the one brother owed the other brother th Um... You know, I can't actually do the math on that right this second, but it's a tale as old as time. And that tale does not end there. Particularly boorish members of the archaeological community have found evidence of overdraft fees in ancient Assyria, ancient Persia, ancient Egypt, and recent discoveries in France suggest that a cave wall was used to tally up overdraft fees over 50,000 years ago. Wow. That, however, is the past. I'm here to talk to you about the future. And the future is Chime. You're broke as a joke, you don't need a $33 overdraft fee. That's utterly ridiculous. Overdraft fees have gotten way out of hand. Like $11 billion in 2019 out of hand. Now please excuse my language, but that is fucking bullshit. Fucking bullshit. Because on the Horror Hill, we do not shy away from naughty language. Especially when we're talking about fees. And I, Jason Hill, host of the Horror Hill podcast, like Chime. Nay, I love Chime, almost as much as I hate overdraft fees. Now even across the internet, I can sense that we are of ilk nature, and we both deserve to have financial peace of mind. Join the millions of Americans already loving Chime. Sign up takes only two minutes, and does not affect your credit score. So get started today at Chime.com slash Horror Hill. 
That's chime, C-H-I-M-E dot com slash horror hill. I love each and every one of you as much as I love chime, which is a lot but not as much as we paid in overdraft fees in 2019. Thank you for your support of this program and of the sponsors that make it possible. The further we pushed, the higher the water crept up our bodies until we were waist-deep in stained, foul-smelling swamp. Brambles and gnarled bushes stuck out from the surface, requiring us to squeeze through or duck under walls of branches. More than before, I felt exposed and vulnerable. Submerged thorns poked at my bare thighs, and the occasional unseen object brushed against my more delicate bits. I tried not to imagine the sensitive skin down there, snagging on an underwater thorn and ripping free. I should have been grateful that it was only so shallow. During the wet season, the water level would be fifty feet higher. Caymans and anacondas would be swimming nearly four stories above us otherwise. The other three pretended as though I weren't there, which I didn't mind at the slightest. I'd have some less than kind things to say about them once I killed a Piraruku and brought it back myself. Oh, dark, delicious satisfaction. Despite the circumstances, a laugh yearned to jump free from my chest. I wanted to watch their sorry faces as they choked on humble pie. The red fish became more than just a job for me. It became validation. Finally... The vegetation thinned out, and our party wound up in a chest-deep lagoon. A quick glance at the sun confirmed we were still going south, towards the pikes, but more submerged trees blocked the horizon beyond. Apparently, the reserve stretched on for longer than we'd thought. As we pushed forward, I noticed something that the other men were too committed to see. Soft, swirling ripples sporadically formed at the surface. In these parts, it could have been any number of creatures, but somehow, I knew they were the telltale signs of Piraruku, taking lungfuls of air. I lingered, watching the men fan out ahead of me. I could feel sharp, solid branches buried in the muck below my feet. If I could fashion one of those into a spear. Lost in thought, the ground below me suddenly gave way and I sank past my nose. Sputtering, I kicked off and forced myself to tread. I stroked through the water, looking around for the others, but they were still walking, the water at their chests. And within a few seconds, my feet met submerged ground once more. I must have wandered through a depression or a hole of some kind. I looked around at the others, and sure enough... Epsilon seemed to bob in the water for a moment before finding his footing again. What the hell? He muttered, reaching down and scraping up something from the water. The moment his hand broke the surface, I knew we were fucked. I only saw the sunlight passing through the eggs slipping between his fingers before the surface next to him exploded. Epsilon cried out in pain, clutching his right shoulder and kicking off from his attacker. The way his arm hung limp told me it was dislocated from a large, fast, blunt force. We're in their fucking nests! I screamed, strafing to the side. Spread out! Away from the center! Delta and Gamma propelled themselves away from the fray. Epsilon could only manage an ungainly, half-treading movement. Even in the cloudy water, I could see his own destruction in his wake. A cloud of dislodged fish eggs, spiraling in the whirls he was making. Claps of water snapped next to him. Get to the trees! I commanded. 
As Delta and Gamma reached for the overhanging boughs, I fished a broken branch from the silt and set off after him. It was flimsy and short, next to useless as a weapon, but even if I could just injure one of the Piraruku, I could both save Epsilon and pursue a then crippled fish. I saw the whirl before it jumped. Hot instinct took over, and I sidestepped in the water. A foaming torrent flared up, and I saw it. A living missile with beady, pitch-black eyes, long as I was tall, slicing through open air like it was nothing. A whip of wind slashed my cheek as it streaked past and splashed into the water behind me, a foot to my right, and it would have taken off my head. I tried to curse, but all that came out was a strangled yelp. My vision tunneled, and I forced myself forward, trying to get to Epsilon, who had almost reached a submerged tree, facing backwards and kicking at his pursuers. Just beyond the range of his flailing feet, one rocketed from the water and struck him square in the chest. Even from a distance, I saw his ribs collapse. A single, deathly puff of air expelled from his mouth, followed swiftly by a dribble of blood. Capillaries burst in his eyes as he choked one last time. Then he sank below the surface. It killed him, I told myself. My god, it fucking killed him. The flimsy waterlogged stick in my grasp seemed even more useless. Commotion behind me welled up. I whipped around to find Gamma and Delta had hoisted themselves up a tree out of the water, but the branches were splitting under their grasps. Below, the muddy water churned with a looming fish. Higher! Delta growled, hurling himself upwards. His branch snapped and hung limp by a few sinews but he had secured a grip on a higher bow. One-handed, the man curled his arm and threw his upper body over the branch, his bare feet a good two meters from the water. Gamma lowered himself to build momentum and pull the same stunt, but his branch snapped. He plunged into the water, still maintaining his death grip. Once again, a few sinews kept the branch attached to the tree and he scrambled to try and climb it like a rope. A monstrous piraruku lanced through the air and sliced through the man's face like butter. Gamma's head dropped to the side, but I could clearly see the gaping hole where his lower jaw once was, shiny and ragged with torn flesh. A broad stripe of red gushed down his exposed front. His fingers loosened, He slid down the branch agonizingly slow, crashing into the water. Blood clouded from his lifeless corpse, which immediately roiled with tiny scavenging fry. Oh, fuck me, I gasped. The lagoon had been churned into a turbulent cauldron of mud and blood, but I saw no more signs of surfacing Piraruku. I signaled silently to Delta pointing from him to the line of dense cover at the lagoon's far end. As he navigated the branches, keeping clear of the water's surface, I lowered past my nose and waded forward as smoothly as possible. My heartbeat amplified in the water, nothing short of a signaling drum for any more piraruku, but nothing more disturbed the surface. Apparently, we'd moved past their nests at that point, I met Delta at the tree line. The swamp stretched far beyond their twisted trunks, but at least the water level was in our wastes now. He lowered himself down from the branches and splashed in front of me with a simmering glare. Still vying to take down one of those beasts, he said coldly. Silence yourself and savor whatever shred of dignity you have left, I snapped. Those things cut our party in half in less than a minute, Delta growled. Dignity is out of the question. You and I are next. I pray I can at least watch you die first. Rage bled in me and I splashed over to him, grabbing his forearm. Why not 
just fucking kill me. Now. Reap the satisfaction. Nelta didn't resist. He simply stared at me with the coolest of expressions. Because you're just not worth it. I shoved him away but responded no further. As angry as I was, I couldn't deny that he was correct. To an extent. Without proper weapons, taking out a Piraruku in their turf would be suicide. There were two bodies in the lagoon north of us who could attest to that. Completing this mission never before felt more nebulous. I never admitted to Delta, but simply getting out alive seemed the most pragmatic option. I've been trained to think outside the box, to improvise, to always be two steps ahead of the game. But now... I felt truly trapped, unable to think beyond what I could immediately see. The tribesmen didn't think we could do it. Time was proving them more and more right. To our left, something rustled in the bushes. Delta and I whipped around to look, but the undergrowth was too dense. A hoarse whisper cut through the brush, the tribesmen's native language. Move, I said. They said they'd be hunting us too. The unseen warrior shouted something, and a horribly familiar noise erupted in response. Oh, fuck. Go, go, go! I shouted. Delta and I submerged, breaststroking through the water, dipping underneath the overhanging branches. Two splashes sounded off somewhere behind us followed by the sharp, noisy slaps of dog paddling. We arrived at a fallen tree and dove underneath it. The log's slimy underside grazed past our backs, and we emerged unscathed about fifteen feet beyond it. I shot a glance behind me. They jumped on top of the log, two huge, muscular, tawny pit bulls with red-tinted eyes and black lips jagged and torn from barking. They caught sight of us, their teeth gleaming like sabers. Then, they sprung into the water, panting and paddling towards us. Under! Delta shouted. We both submerged, scattering in separate directions. I felt around more than I saw, pulling and squeezing my way past sunken roots. With my sense of touch heightened, I detected the dog's wake before it could strike. I wheeled around, stirring up a cloud of silt, and I saw pale eyes and a maw of canine teeth emerge from the gloom. I thrust my hand below its mouth. I grasped the wet fur of its throat and hung on. The dog struggled and writhed, spinning underwater and dragging me along, all the while snapping its ravening jaws at me, mere inches from my face, bubbles streaming, eyes rolling, paws clawing at my exposed arms and stomach. It kicked to the surface. Sunlight and clean air hit me and I gasped for breath. The pit bull emerged next. Still held at arm's length, its barks like railgun blasts in my face. It paddled forward, pushing me through the water until my back crashed into a tree. The dog slashed and clawed, overpowering my arm's strength, inching closer and closer to my throat. With a bellow, I thrust my free arm through the air and drove my thumb into its eye. It yelped and yanked its neck from my grasp, half-blinded and paddling off. I looked around for Delta. It was twenty feet off from me, locked in a similar half-submerged battle with the second pit bull. I swam forward to help. When I reached them, I grabbed the scruff of the dog's neck and yanked it off Delta, who was scratched up and bleeding freely into the water. I primed my arm to gouge the second dog's eyes. The first dog lunged from behind and seized my wrist. The pain was excruciating, like a car door with nails, and I let go, letting the force carry me backwards and underwater once more. I heard screams above the surface. Before the bones in my wrist could crack, the first dog let go and pursued Delta along with the second. Survival 
overruled. I kicked off away from the fray, resurfacing some ten feet off, my wrist burning with agony. Delta and the two dogs had been reduced to a watery frenzy of limbs, blood, barks, and screams. The man got in a few blows, signaled by the high-pitched yelps and the flying tufts of fur, but within seconds, the fur was replaced with human flesh, and Delta's struggling form devolved into a dismembered mangle of red. His screams silenced. Fighting the urge to vomit, I simply turned and swam south, towards freedom. The pit bulls did not follow perhaps too weakened or too preoccupied to do so. Once several yards and more undergrowth separated us, I stopped to catch my breath, my injured wrist trembling. My vision overturned, my head was fuzzy with adrenaline. I had grown to hate my crew, but I hadn't wanted them to pay like this. The red fish was supposed to do that. I was supposed to do that. I'd wanted them to feel the misery of defeat and humiliation. Now, the red fish meant nothing to me. Nothing but a cold reminder of all that had put us through this mess. I continued onward through the undergrowth. If the opportunity presented itself, I would take it. But otherwise, getting out alive was now the goal. I emerged into another lagoon... This time, the setting was recognizable. At the far end, the water narrowed into a channel, a channel blocked off by sharp pikes. I looked around. I appeared alone. I could make it across, leave the reserve. They would let me live. Redfish or no redfish, I was going to make it. As I swam forward, I noticed something that hadn't been there before. An overturned canoe floating in the water before me, surrounded by surfacing Peruku. My mind immediately drew a connection. Much like how floating debris in the open ocean attracted seafaring fish, this abandoned canoe seemed to serve as a gathering point for Peruku. And they hadn't noticed me. If I could sneak up on one and catch one, just one by surprise, I'd have the edge. Holding on and dispatching it would be another story, but I tried not to think about it as I entered stealth mode and approached the canoe. The fish continued to surface regularly, thirty feet. My motions were careful and calculated. Only my eyes and forehead were visible above the water. Twenty feet. They still seemed preoccupied with the canoe. The boat was dark in color, not the same ones we had arrived in several hours earlier. Was it one of the tribesmen's canoes? What was it doing overturned in the middle of the lagoon in the first place? At ten feet, the fish scattered. I slapped at the water belting out a string of curses. It was over. I lacked the energy to pursue them further, and the longer I lingered, the more likely the tribesmen would find some other way to kill me. Then, the canoe moved. It swiveled in the water to face me. That's when I saw the pattern of scales the organic way the sunlight reflected off of it. It sank, a red, scallop-shaped tail the size of a sewer grate swirled through the water above it before it disappeared. Oh, God, was all I could muster. The water below transformed into a suction. I was too paralyzed to resist, I sank feet first below the surface, watching helplessly as my legs disappeared into the leviathan Piraruku's gaping mouth. I caught sight of its black eyes, unfeeling, uncaring, before my head slipped past its bony lips. 
Within a second, I was encased in a black, fleshy, watery coffin. True fear set in. I thought back to my crew, the violent progression of death that had whittled us down, each more hideous than the last, ending with me being swallowed alive by an outlandishly huge red fish. The muscles in its throat contracted, squeezing me further down its gullet. I gave up. I waited for the sting of stomach acid, the strangling noxiousness of gas. Instead, what I got was light, not sunlight. This was a deep, hellish red. I couldn't determine where it was coming from. I assumed it was a hallucination induced from a lack of oxygen, but I could clearly see the inside of the fish illuminated around me, the pulsating walls of its guts, the outline of its spine and ribs dripping with moisture. And there were others. There were others inside the fish with me. I rolled over onto my stomach and screamed. Five bodies below me, all staring up in differing states of grotesqueness. Two with shattered foreheads. One bleeding from the mouth. One with his lower jaw missing. And one nearly torn apart, his muscles and organs exposed. My men. For the first time in my life, I broke. I closed my eyes and shrieked, beating at the organic wall around me, the cadavers below, my own flesh, crying for deliverance, an end, a mercy killing to take me away from whatever fresh hell this was. I don't remember much else after that. All I know is at some point I ended up outside the reserve, back where we started. Our canoes were still there, having run aground on the sloping bank. I stood far up the shoreline, watching as more boats showed up at the pikes. They were slick, motorized, definitely government vessels. Military police jumped from the boats regarding our abandoned canoes before crossing over inside the reserve. They didn't look at me once. I doubt they even noticed me. I doubt that they could have noticed me. Instead, their attention was drawn to something in the lagoon beyond the pikes. It was a corpse floating face down. From my distance, I couldn't tell whose body it was. It could have been mine, for all I knew. Yep, it's one of them, one of the soldiers confirmed. Matches the description the ferryman gave us. All they wanted to do was go fishing, another said, shaking his head. Those goddamn savages, a third growled. See how far the little deal goes now. Brandishing their carbines. They stalked deeper into the reserve. A day later, drifting among the crowds of the local town, I learned that with the murders of the six fishermen, the deal between the politicians and the indigenous tribesmen had dissolved. The proposed law protecting the Piruruku was tossed and the tribe responsible for their deaths had been neutralized. The atmosphere in the town was of celebration, with no more encroaching regulations and no indigenous tribes to worry about. Local fishermen were readying their harpoons and nets to set out and take advantage of the surprise bounty. Some expressed their concerns warning that the sudden influx of fishing pressure would irrevocably damage the Piraruku populations. 
leading to their extinction from the area. But the red fish's allure was too strong to grant them any credence. A few of these fishermen, I noticed, were showing off their new toys. Spear guns. Dynamite. Canisters of poison. Things they couldn't have gotten without a little outside help. It didn't take long to guess who in the region had the money and the motivation to fund their missions. I guess my client was right in the end. With the will and the means, who was he to deny what he wanted? Suddenly, Gamma's suspicions about having been lied to made sense. I couldn't stop them if I tried. Greed had overtaken them. They were beyond saving. Mindless husks set out to reap the Piraruku. In the end, there'd only be one winner, and I hated him for it. Instead, all I could do was wonder what would become of them. I found myself wishing my fate upon them all, a stripping a gauntlet, suffering, and finally, to cap it all off, ravenous, all-consuming, death. Hopefully, in the end, they would learn to realize the futility of their endeavors. Maybe they end up like me, something less than flesh more than idea, an imprint of sin, a shade. Hopefully, they'd learn to finally respect the red fish. You've been listening to The Red Fish by author Nick Carlson. It was most certainly fate that Nick Carlson would find a passion for horror writing. At a young age, he could be seen overturning rocks and logs, looking for only the creepiest insects and worms the dirt had to offer. This fascination with nature's oddities only compounded as he got older. Now, he free handles spiders and snakes whenever he can and grapples with stingrays and sharks whenever he finds himself on the beach. He still has both his hands, so he's not going to stop anytime soon. The thrill of uncovering and exposing the grotesque side of nature fed into a desire to elicit discomfort and provoke thought through writing. Nick believes horror and new weird are not only the most versatile and time-tested genres, but are also fun as hell to write. He self-published his first sci-fi horror novel, Simeon, in 2020, and was featured in The Unknown, a COVID-19 charity anthology the same year. Apart from writing, Nick is also an avid hiker, fisherman, classical composer, and organist. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference, and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks, available now on audible.com. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today, and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, 
and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the horror hill for yet another dance with darkness. I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener. And whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, as well as a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill unless otherwise noted. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Felipe Ojeda under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's logo was created by Craig Groshek, and this week's artwork provided by Omega Black, unless otherwise noted. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you've heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more, and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for hundreds of free audio horror stories, including more performances from yours truly, and consider supporting us by becoming a patron at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, I'm Jason Hill, and you've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast. Good evening, and sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.